introduction of travels in the interior of africa this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c travels in the interior of africa by mungo park introduction mungo park was born on the tenth of september seventeen seventy one the son of a farmer at Fowlshields near selkirk after studying medicine in edinburgh he went out at the age of twenty one assistant surgeon in a ship bound for the east indies when he came back the african society was in want of an explorer to take the place of major houghton who had died mungo park volunteered was accepted and in his twenty-fourth year on the twenty-second of may seventeen ninety five he sailed for the coasts of senegal where he arrived in june thence he proceeded on the travels of which this book is the record he was absent from england for a little more than two years and a half returning a few days before christmas seventeen ninety seven he was then twenty-six years old the african association published the first edition of his travels as travels in the interior districts of africa seventeen ninety five to seventeen ninety seven by mungo park with an appendix containing geographical illustrations of africa by major rennell park married and settled at peebles in medical practice but was persuaded by the government to go out again he sailed from portsmouth on the thirtieth of january eighteen o five resolved to trace the niger to its source or perish in the attempt he perished the natives attacked him while passing through a narrow strait of the river at bosa and killed him with all that remained of his party except one slave the record of this fatal voyage partly gathered from his journals and closed by evidences of the matter of his death was first published in eighteen fifteen as the journal of a mission to the interior of africa in eighteen o five by mungo park together with other documents official and private relating to the same mission to which is prefixed an account of the life of mr park end of introduction Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Volume 1, Chapter 1 of Travels in the Interior of Africa. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Travels in the Interior of Africa by Mungo Park Journey from Portsmouth to the Gambia Soon after my return from the East Indies in 1793, having learned that the noblemen and gentlemen associated for the purpose of prosecuting discoveries in the interior of Africa were desirous of engaging a person to explore the continent by the way of the gambia river i took occasion through means of the president of the royal society to whom i had the honor to be known of offering myself for that service i had been informed that a gentleman of the name of houghton a captain in the army and formerly fort major at goree had already sailed to the gambia under the direction of the association and that there was reason to apprehend he had fallen a sacrifice to the climate or perished in some contest with the natives but this intelligence 
instead of deterring me from my purpose, animated me to persist in the offer of my services with the greater solicitude. I had a passionate desire to examine into the productions of a country so little known, and to become experimentally acquainted with the modes of life and character of the natives. I knew that I was able to bear fatigue, and I relied on my youth and the strength of my constitution to preserve me from the effects of the climate. The salary which the committee allowed was sufficiently large, and I made no stipulation for future reward. If I should perish in my journey, I was willing that my hopes and expectations should perish with me, and if I should succeed in rendering the geography of Africa more familiar to my countrymen and in opening to their ambition and industry new sources of wealth and new channels of commerce, I knew that I was in the hands of men of honor who would not fail to bestow that remuneration which my successful services should appear to them to merit. The committee of the association, having made such inquiries as they thought necessary, declared themselves satisfied with the qualifications that I possessed, and accepted me for the service, and with that liberality which on all occasions distinguishes their conduct, gave me every encouragement which it was in their power to grant, or which I could with propriety ask. It was at first proposed that I should accompany Mr. James Willis, who was then recently appointed consul at Senegambia, and whose countenance in that capacity, it was thought, might have served and protected me, but government afterwards rescinded his appointment, and I lost that advantage. The kindness of the committee, however, supplied all that was necessary. Being favored by the secretary of the association, the late Henry Beaufoy, Esquire, with a recommendation to Dr. John Laidley, a gentleman who had resided many years at an English factory on the banks of the Gambia, and furnished with a letter of credit on him for two hundred pounds, I took my passage in the brig Endeavour, a small vessel trading to the Gambia for beeswax and ivory, commanded by Captain Richard Wyatt, and I became impatient for my departure. My instructions were very plain and concise. I was directed, on my arrival in Africa, to pass on to the river Niger, either by way of Bambuk or by such other route as should be found most convenient, that I should ascertain the course, and if possible, the rise and termination of that river, that I should use my utmost exertions to visit the principal towns or cities in its neighborhood, particularly Timbuktu and Hausa, and that I should be afterwards at liberty to return to Europe, either by way of the Gambia or by such other route as, under all the then existing circumstances of my situation and prospects, should appear to me to be most advisable. We sailed from Portsmouth on the 22nd day of May, 1795. On the 4th of June, we saw the mountains over Mogador, on the coast of Africa, and on the 21st of the same month, after a pleasant voyage of 30 days, we anchored at Gilfury, a town on the northern bank of the river Gambia, opposite to James Island, where the English had formerly a small fort. The kingdom of Bera, in which the town of Gilfrey is situated, produces great plenty of the necessaries of life, but the chief trade of the inhabitants is in salt, which commodity they carry up the river in canoes as high as Baraconda, 
and bring down in return Indian corn, cotton claws, elephant's teeth, small quantities of gold dust, etc. The number of canoes and people constantly employed in this trade makes the king of Bera more formidable to Europeans than any other chieftain on the river, and this circumstance probably encouraged him to establish these exorbitant duties which traders of all nations are obliged to pay at entry, amounting to nearly twenty pounds on every vessel, great and small. These duties or customs are generally collected in person by the alcade, or governor of Geoffrey, and he is attended on these occasions by a numerous train of dependents, among whom are found many who, by their frequent intercourse with the English, have acquired a smattering of our language, but they are commonly very noisy and very troublesome, begging for everything they fancy with such earnestness and importunity the traders, in order to get quit of them, are frequently obliged to grant their requests. On the 23rd we departed from Geoffrey and proceeded to Vinatane, a town situated about two miles up a creek on the southern side of the river. This place is much resorted to by Europeans on account of the great quantities of beeswax which are brought hither for sale. The wax is collected in the woods by the Faloops, a wild and unsociable race of people. Their country, which is of considerable extent, abounds in rice, and the natives supply the traders, both on the Gambia and Casamansa rivers, with that article, and also with goats and poultry, on very reasonable terms. The honey which they collect is chiefly used by themselves in making a strong intoxicating liquor, much the same as the mead which is produced from honey in Great Britain. In their traffic with Europeans, the Faloops generally employ a factor or agent of the Mandigo nation, who speaks a little English and is acquainted with the trade of the river. This broker makes the bargain, and, with the conveyance of the European, receives a certain part only of the payment, which he gives to his employer as the whole. The remainder, which is very truly called the cheating money, he receives when the faloup is gone, and appropriates to himself as a reward for his trouble. The language of the Faloops is appropriate and peculiar, and as their trade is chiefly conducted, as hath been observed, by Mandigos, the Europeans have no inducement to learn it. On the 26th we left Vindane, and continued our course up the river, anchoring whenever the tide failed us, and frequently towing the vessel with the boat. The river is deep and muddy, the banks are covered with impenetrable thickets of mangrove, and the whole of the adjacent country appears to be flat and swampy. The Gambia abounds with fish, some species of which are excellent food, but none of them that I recollect are known in Europe. At the entrance from the sea, sharks are found in great abundance, and higher up, alligators and the hippopotamus or river horse are very numerous in six days after leaving vintin we reached john aconda a place of considerable trade where our vessel was to take in part of her lading the next morning the several european traders came from their different factories to receive their letters and learn the nature and amount of her cargo and the captain dispatched a messenger to Dr. Laidley to inform him of my arrival. He came to Jock Aconda the morning following, when I delivered him Mr. Beaufoy's letter, and he gave me a kind invitation 
to spend my time at his house until an opportunity should offer of prosecuting my journey this invitation was too acceptable to be refused and being furnished with the doctor with a horse and guide i set out from jockaconda at daybreak on the fifth of july and at eleven o'clock arrived in pisania where i was accommodated with a room and other conveniences in the doctor's house pisania is a small village in the king of yanni's dominions established by british subjects as a factory for trade and inhabited solely by them and their black servants it is situated on the banks of the gambia sixteen miles above Jonaconda. the white residents at the time of may arrival there consisted only of dr Laidley and two gentlemen who were brothers of the name of ainsley but their domestics were numerous they enjoyed perfect security under the king's protection and being highly esteemed and respected by the natives at large wanted no accommodation or comfort which the country could supply and the greatest part of the trade in slaves ivory and gold was in their hands being now settled for some time at my ease my first object was to learn the mandigo tongue being the language in almost general use throughout this part of africa and without which i was fully convinced that i never could acquire an extensive knowledge of the country or its inhabitants in this pursuit i was greatly assisted by dr Laidley. in researches of this kind and in observing the manners and customs of the natives in a country so little known to the nations of europe and furnished with so many striking and uncommon objects of nature my time passed not unpleasantly and i began to flatter myself that i had escaped the fever or seasoning to which europeans on their first arrival in hot climates are generally subject but on the thirty first of july i imprudently exposed myself to the night dew in observing an eclipse of the moon with a view to determine the longitude of the place the next day i found myself attacked with a smart fever and delirium and such an illness followed as confined me to the house during the greatest part of august my recovery was very slow but i embraced every short interval of convalescence to walk out and make myself acquainted with the productions of the country in one of those excursions having rambled farther than usual on a hot day i brought on a return of my fever and on the tenth of september i was again confined to my bed the fever however was not so violent as before and in the course of three weeks i was able when the weather would permit to renew my botanical excursions and when it rained i amused myself with drawing plants etc in my chamber the care and attention of dr Laidley contributed greatly to alleviate my sufferings his company and conversation beguiled the tedious hours during that gloomy season when the rain falls in torrents when suffocating heat oppress by day and when the night is spent by the terrified travellers in listening to the croaking of frogs of which the numbers are beyond imagination the shrill cry of the jackal and the deep howling of the hyena a dismal concert interrupted only by the roar of such tremendous thunder as no person can form a conception of but those who have heard it the country itself being an immense level and very generally covered with wood presents a tiresome and gloomy uniformity to the eye but although nature has denied to the inhabitants the beauties of romantic landscapes she has bestowed on them with a liberal hand 
the more important blessings of fertility and abundance a little attention to cultivation procures a sufficiency of corn the fields afford a rich pasturage for cattle and the natives are plentifully supplied with excellent fish both from the gambia river and the wali creek the grains which are chiefly cultivated are indian corn zia maize two kinds of holcus spicatus called by the natives sono and sanio holcus niger and holcus bicolor the former of which they have named bassi Wulima, and the latter bassi qui these together with rice are raised in considerable quantities besides which the inhabitants in the vicinity of the towns and villages have gardens which produce onions calavances yams cassavi ground nuts pompions gourds watermelons and some other esculent plants i observe likewise near the towns small patches of cotton and indigo the former of these articles supplies them with clothing and with the latter they dye their cloth of an excellent blue color in a manner that will hereafter be described in preparing their corn for food the natives use a large wooden mortar called a palloon in which they bruise the seed until it parts with the outer covering or husk which is then separated from the clean corn by exposing it to the wind nearly in the same manner as wheat is cleared from the chaff in england the corn thus freed from the husk is returned to the mortar and beaten into meal which is dressed variously in different countries but the most common preparation of it among the nations of the gambia is a sort of pudding which they call couscous it is made from first moistening the flour with water and then stirring and shaking it about in a large calabash or gourd till it adheres together in small granules resembling sago it is then put into an earthen pot whose bottom is perforated with a number of small holes and this pot being placed upon another the two vessels are looted together either with a paste of meal and water or with cow's dung and placed upon the fire in the lower vessel is commonly some animal food and water the steam or vapor of which ascends through the perforations in the bottom of the upper vessel and softens and the couscous which is very much esteemed throughout all the countries that i visited i am informed that the same manner of preparing flour is very generally used on the barbary coast and that the dish is so prepared is there called by the same name it is therefore probable that the negroes borrowed the practice from the moors their domestic animals are nearly the same as in europe swine are found in the woods but their flesh is not esteemed probably the marked abhorrence in which this animal is held by the votaries of mohammed has spread itself among the pagans poultry of all kinds the turkey excepted is everywhere to be had the guinea fowl and red partridge abound in the fields and the woods furnish a small species of antelope of which the venison is highly and deservedly prized of the other wild animals in the mandigo countries the most common are the hyena the panther and the elephant considering the use that is made of the latter in the east indies it may be thought extraordinary that the natives of africa have not in any part of this immense continent acquired the skill of taming this powerful and docile creature and applying his strength and faculties to the service of man when i told some of the natives that this was actually done in the countries of the east 
my auditors laughed me to scorn and exclaimed tobacco fornio a white man's lie the negroes frequently find means to destroy the elephant by firearms they hunt it principally for the sake of the teeth which they transfer in barter to those who sell them again to the europeans the flesh they eat and consider it a great delicacy on the sixth of october the waters of the gambia were at the greatest height being fifteen feet above the high water mark of the tide after which they began to subside at first slowly but afterwards very rapidly sometimes sinking more than a foot in twenty-four hours by the beginning of november the river had sunk to its former level and the tide ebbed and flowed as usual when the river had subsided and the atmosphere grew dry i recovered space and began to think of my departure for this is reckoned the most proper season for travelling the natives had completed their harvest and provisions were everywhere cheap and plentiful dr laidley was at this time employed in a trading voyage at jacaconda i wrote him to desire that he would use his interest with the slatees or slave merchants to procure me the company and protection of the first coffle or caravan that might leave gambia for the interior country and in the meantime i requested him to purchase for me a horse and two asses a few days afterwards the doctor returned to pisana and informed me that a coffle would certainly go for the interior in the course of the dry season but that as many of the merchants belonging to it had not yet completed their assortment of goods he could not say at what time they would set out as the characters and dispositions of the slatees and people that composed the caravan were entirely unknown to me and they seemed rather averse to my purpose and unwilling to enter into any positive engagements on my account and the time of their departure being with all very uncertain i resolved on further deliberation to avail myself of the dry season and proceed without them dr laidley approved my determination and promised me every assistance in his power to enable me to prosecute my journey with comfort and safety this resolution having been formed i made preparations accordingly and now being about to take leave of my hospitable friend whose kindness and solicitude continued to the moment of my departure and to quit for many months the countries bordering on the gambia it seems proper before i proceed with my narrative that i should in this place give some account of the several negro nations which inhabit the banks of this celebrated river and the commercial intercourse that subsists between them and such of the nations of europe as find their advantage in trading to this part of africa the observations which have occurred to me on both these subjects will be found in the following chapter end of chapter one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Volume 1, Chapter 2 of Travels in the Interior of Africa by Mungo Park. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Language and Religion of the Natives The natives of the countries bordering on the Gambia, though distributed into a great many distinct governments, may, I think, be divided into four great classes the faloops the jalofs the fulas and the mandigos among all these nations the religion of mohammed has made and continues to make considerable progress 
but in most of them the body of the people both free and enslaved persevere in maintaining the blind but harmless superstitions of their ancestors and are called by the mohammedans kafirs or infidels of the faloops i have little to add to what has been observed concerning them in the former chapter they are of a gloomy disposition and are supposed never to forgive an injury they are even said to transmit their quarrels as deadly feuds to their posterity insomuch that a son considers it as incumbent on him from a just sense of filial obligation to become the avenger of his deceased father's wrongs if a man loses his life in one of these sudden quarrels which perpetually occur at their feasts when the whole party is intoxicated with mead his son or the eldest of his sons if he has more than one endeavors to procure his father's sandals which he wears once a year on the anniversary of his father's death until a fit opportunity offers of revenging his fate when the object of his resentment seldom escapes his pursuit this fierce and unrelenting disposition is however counterbalanced by many good qualities they display the utmost gratitude and affection towards their benefactors and the fidelity with which they preserve whatever is entrusted to them is remarkable during the present war they have more than once taken up arms to defend our merchant vessels from french privateers and english property of considerable value has frequently been left at vintain for a long time entirely under the care of the faloops who have uniformly manifested on such occasions the strictest honesty and punctuality how greatly is it to be wished that the minds of a people so determined and faithful could be softened and civilized by the mild and benevolent spirit of christianity the jalofs or yalofs are an active powerful and warlike race inhabiting great part of that tract which lies between the river senegal and the bandingo states on the gambia yet they differ from the mandingos not only in language but likewise in complexion and features the noses of the jalofs are not so much depressed nor the lips so protuberant as among the generality of africans and although their skin is of the deepest black they are considered by the white traders as the most sightly negroes on this part of the continent their language is said to be copious and significant and is often learnt by europeans trading to senegal the fulas or folies such as them at least as reside near the gambia are chiefly of a tawny complexion with soft silky hair and pleasing features they are much attached to a pastoral life and have introduced themselves into all the kingdoms on the windward coast as herdsmen and husbandmen paying a tribute to the sovereign of the country for the lands which they hold not having many opportunities however during my residence at pisana of improving my acquaintance with these people i defer entering at large into their character until a fitter occasion occurs which will present itself when i come to bondu the mandingos of whom it remains to speak constitute in truth the bulk of the inhabitants in all those districts of africa which i visited and their language with a few exceptions is universally understood and very generally spoken in that part of the continent they are called mandingos i conceive as having originally migrated from the interior state of manding 
of which some account will hereafter be given in every considerable town there is a chief magistrate called the alkid whose office is hereditary and whose business it is to preserve order to levy duties on travellers and to preside at all conferences in the exercise of local jurisdiction and the administration of justice these courts are composed of the elders of the town of free condition and are termed palavers and their proceedings are conducted in the open air with sufficient solemnity both sides of a question are freely canvassed witnesses are publicly examined and the decisions which follow generally meet with the approbation of the surrounding audience as negroes have no written language of their own the general rule of decision is an appeal to ancient custom but since the system of mohammed has made so great progress among them the converts to that faith have gradually introduced with the religious tenets many of the civil institutions of the prophet and where the koran is not found sufficiently explicit recourse is had to a commentary called al shara containing as i was told a complete exposition or digest of the mohammedan laws both civil and criminal properly arranged and illustrated this frequency of appeal to written laws with which the pagan natives are necessarily unacquainted has given rise in their palvers to what i little expected to find in africa professional advocates or expounders of the law who are allowed to appear and to plead for plaintiff or defendant much in the same manner as counsel in the law courts of great britain they are mohammedan negroes who have made or affect to have made the laws of the prophet their particular study and if i may judge from their harangues which i frequently attended i believe that in the forensic qualifications of procrastination and cavil and the arts of confounding and perplexing a cause they are not always surpassed by the ablest pleaders in europe while i was at pisana a cause was heard which furnished the mohammedan lawyers with an admirable opportunity of displaying their professional dexterity the cause was this an ass belonging to a sarah woolly negro a native of an interior country near the river senegal had broke into a field of corn belonging to one of the mandingo inhabitants and destroyed great part of it the mandingo having caught the animal in his field immediately drew his knife and cut his throat the Sirawuli thereupon called a palver, or in European terms, brought an action to recover damages for the loss of his beast, on which he set a high value. The defendant confessed that he had killed the ass, but pleaded a set-off, insisting that the loss he had sustained by the ravage in his corn was equal to the sum demanded for the animal to ascertain this fact was the point at issue and the learned advocates contrived to puzzle the cause in such a manner that after a hearing of three days the court broke up without coming to any determination upon it and a second palverer was i suppose thought necessary the mandingos generally speaking are of a mild sociable and obliging disposition the men are commonly above the middle size well shaped strong and capable of enduring great labor the women are good-natured sprightly and agreeable the dress of both sexes is composed of cotton cloth of their own manufacture that of the men is a loose frock not unlike a surplice 
with drawers which reach halfway down the leg, and they wear sandals on their feet, and white cotton caps on their heads. The women's dress consists of two pieces of cloth, each of which is about six feet long and three broad. One of these they wrap around their waist, which, hanging down to the ankles, answers the purpose of a petticoat. The other is thrown negligently over the bosom and shoulders. This account of their clothing is indeed nearly applicable to the natives of all the different countries in this part of Africa. A peculiar national mode is observable only in the headdresses of the women. Thus, in the countries of the Gambia, the females wear a sort of bandage, which they call jala. It is a narrow strip of cotton cloth wrapped many times round, immediately over the forehead. In Bondu, the head is encircled with strings of white beads, and a small plate of gold is worn in the middle of the forehead. In Kasson, the ladies decorate their heads in a very tasteful and elegant manner, with white seashells. In Karta and Ludamar, the women raise their hair to a great height by the addition of a pad, as the ladies did formerly in Great Britain, which they decorate with a species of coral brought from the Red Sea by pilgrims returning from Mecca and sold at a great price. In the construction of their dwelling houses, the Mandingos also conform to the general practice of the African nations in this part of the continent, contenting themselves with small and incommodious hovels, a circular mud wall about four feet high, upon which is placed a conical roof, composed of the bamboo cane and thatched with grass, forms alike the palace of a king and the hovel of a slave. Their Household furniture is equally simple. A hurdle of canes placed upon upright sticks, about two feet from the ground, upon which is spread a mat or bullock's hide, answers the purpose of a bed. A water jar, some earthen pots for dressing their food, a few wooden bowls and calabashes, and one or two low stools compose the rest. As every man of free condition has a plurality of wives, it is found necessary, to prevent, I suppose, matrimonial disputes, that each of the ladies should be accommodated with a hut to herself, and all the huts belonging to the same family are surrounded by a fence constructed of bamboo canes, split and formed into a sort of wicker work. The whole enclosure is called a cirque, or cirque. A number of these enclosures, with narrow passages between them, form what is called a town, but the huts are generally placed without any regularity, according to the caprice of the owner. The only rule that seems to be attended to is placing the door towards the southwest, in order to admit the sea breeze. In each town is a large stage called the Bentang, which answers the purpose of a public hall or town house. It is composed of interwoven canes and is generally sheltered from the sun by being erected in the shade of some large tree. It is here that all public affairs are transacted and trials conducted and here the lazy and indolent meet to smoke their pipes, and hear the news of the day. In most of the towns the Mohammedans have also a mezura, or mosque, in which they assemble and offer up their daily prayers, according to the rules of the Koran. In the account which I have thus given of the natives, the reader must bear in mind that my observations appear chiefly to persons of free condition, which constitute, I suppose, not more than one-fourth part of the inhabitants at large. The other three-fourths are in a state of hopeless and hereditary slavery, and are employed in cultivating the land, 
in the care of cattle and in servile offices of all kinds much in the same manner as the slaves in the west indies i was told however that the mandingo master can neither deprive his slave of life nor sell him to a stranger without first calling a palaver on his conduct or in other words bringing him to a public trial but this degree of protection is extended only to the native or domestic slave captives taken in war and those unfortunate victims who are condemned to slavery for crimes or insolvency and in short all those unhappy people who are brought down from the interior countries for sale have no security whatever and may be treated and disposed of in all respects as the owner thinks proper it sometimes happens indeed when no ships are on the coast that a humane and considerate master incorporates his purchased slaves among his domestics and their offspring at least if not the parents become entitled to all privileges of the native class the earliest european establishment on this celebrated river was a factory of the portuguese and to this must be ascribed the introduction of the numerous words of that language which are still in use among the negroes the dutch french and english afterwards successfully possessed themselves of settlements on the coast but the trade of the gambia became and continued for many years a sort of monopoly in the hands of the english in the travels of francis moore is preserved an account of the royal african company's establishments in this river in the year seventeen thirty at which the james factory alone consisted of a governor deputy governor and two other principal officers eight factors thirteen writers twenty inferior attendants and tradesmen a company of soldiers and thirty-two negro servants besides sloops shallops and boats with their crews and there were no less than eight subordinate factories in other parts of the river the trade with europe by being afterwards laid open was almost annihilated the share which the subjects of england at this time hold in it supports not more than two or three annual ships and i am informed that the gross value of british exports is under twenty thousand pounds the french and danes still maintain a small share and the americans have lately sent a few vessels to the gambia by way of experiment the commodities exported to the gambia from europe consist chiefly of firearms and ammunition ironware spirituous liquors tobacco cotton caps a small quantity of broadcloth and a few articles of the manufacture of manchester a small assortment of india goods with some glass beads amber and other trifles for which are taken in exchange slaves gold dust ivory beeswax and hides slaves are the chief article but the whole number which at this time are annually exported from the gambia by all nations is supposed to be under one thousand most of these unfortunate victims are brought to the coast in periodical caravans many of them from very remote inland countries for the language which they speak is not understood by the inhabitants of the maritime districts in subsequent part of my work i shall give the best information i have been able to collect concerning the manner in which they are obtained on their arrival at the coast if no immediate opportunity offers of selling them to advantage they are distributed among the neighboring villages until a slave ship arrives or until they can be sold to black traders who sometimes purchase on speculation in the meanwhile 
the poor wretches are kept constantly fettered two and two of them being chained together and employed in the labors of the field and i am sorry to add are very scantily fed as well as harshly treated the price of a slave varies according to the number of purchasers from europe and the arrival of caravans from the interior but in general i reckon that a young and healthy male from sixteen to twenty-five years of age may be estimated on the spot from eighteen to twenty pounds sterling the negro slave merchants as i have observed in the former chapter are called slatties who besides slaves and the merchandise which they bring for sale to the whites supply the inhabitants of the maritime districts with native iron sweet-smelling gums and frankincense and a commodity called shea tulu which literally translated signifies tree butter in payment of these articles the maritime states supply the interior countries with salt a scarce and valuable commodity as i frequently and painfully experienced in the course of my journey considerable quantities of this article however are also supplied to the inland natives by the moors who obtain it from the salt pits in the great desert and receive in return corn cotton cloth and slaves in their early intercourse with europeans the article that attracted most notice was iron its utility in forming the instruments of war and husbandry make it preferable to, to all others and iron soon became the measure by which the value of all other commodities was ascertained thus a certain quantity of goods of whatever denomination appearing to be equal in value to a bar of iron constituted in the trader's phraseology a bar of that particular merchandise twenty leaves of tobacco for instance were considered as a bar of tobacco and a gallon of spirits or rather spirit or rather half spirits and half water as a bar of rum a bar of one commodity being reckoned equal in value to a bar of another commodity as however it must unavoidably happen that according to the plenty or scarcity of goods at market in proportion to the demand the relative value would be subject to continual fluctuation greater precision has been found necessary and at this time the current value of a single bar of any kind is fixed by the whites at two shillings sterling thus a slave whose price is fifteen pounds is said to be worth a hundred and fifty bars in transactions of this nature it is obvious that the white trader has infinitely the advantage over the african whom therefore it is difficult to satisfy for conscious of his own ignorance he naturally becomes exceedingly suspicious and wavering and indeed so very unsettled and jealous are the negroes in their dealings with the whites that a bargain is never considered by the european as concluded until the purchase money is paid and the party has taken leave having now brought together such general observations on the country and its inhabitants as occurred to me during my residence in the vicinity of the gambia i shall detain the reader no longer with introductory matter but proceed in the next chapter to a regular detail of the incidents which happened and the reflections which arose in my mind in the course of my painful and perilous journey from its commencement until my return to the gambia end of volume one chapter two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume one chapter three of travels in the interior of africa 
by Mungo Park. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Kingdom of Woolly Journey to Bondu On the 2nd of December, 1795, I took my departure from the hospitable mansion of Dr. Laidley. I was fortunately provided with a Negro servant who spoke both the English and Mandingo tongues. His name was Johnson. He was a native of this part of Africa, and having in his youth been conveyed to Jamaica as a slave, he had been made free and taken to England by his master, where he had resided many years, and at length found his way back to his native country. As he was known to Dr. Laidley, the doctor recommended him to me, and I hired him as my interpreter, at the rate of ten bars monthly to be paid to himself, and five bars a month to be paid to his wife during his absence. Dr. Laidley furthermore provided me with a negro boy of his own, named Demba, a sprightly youth, who, besides Mandingo, spoke the language of the Sarah Woolies, an inland people of whom mention will be hereafter be made, residing on the banks of the Sengal, and to induce him to behave well, the doctor promised him his freedom on his return, in case I should report favorably of his fidelity and services. I was furnished with a horse for myself, a small but very hardy and spirited beast, which cost me to the value of seven pounds ten shillings, and two asses for my interpreter and servant. My baggage was light, consisting chiefly of provisions for two days, a small assortment of beads, amber, and tobacco, for the purchase of a fresh supply as I proceeded, a few changes of linen and other necessary apparel, an umbrella, a pocket sextant, a magnetic compass, and a thermometer, together with two fowling pieces, two pairs of pistols, and some other small articles. A free man, a Bashreen, or Mohammedan, named Madibu, who was traveling to the kingdom of Bambara, and two Slatis, or slave merchants, of the Sarawili nation, and of the same sect, who were going to Bondu, offered their services as far as they intended respectively to proceed, as did likewise a negro named Tammy, also a Mohammedan, a native of Kasson, who had been employed some years by Dr. Laidley as a blacksmith, and was returning to his native country with the savings of his labors. All these men traveled on foot, driving their asses before them. Thus I had no less than six attendants, all of whom had been taught to regard me with great respect, and to consider that their safe return hereafter to their countries on the Gambia would depend on my preservation. Dr. Laidley himself and Mrs. Ainsley, with a number of their domestics, kindly determined to accompany me the first two days and I believe they secretly thought they should never see me afterwards. We reached Jindley the same day, having crossed the Wally Creek, a branch of the Gambia, and rested at the house of a black woman, who had formerly been the paramour of a white trader named Hewitt, and who, in consequence thereof, was called, by way of distinction, Senorita, in the evening we walked out to see an adjoining village belonging to a slatty named Jemafu Momadu, the richest of all the Gambian traders. We found him at home, and he thought so highly of the honor done him by this visit that he presented us with a fine bullock, which was immediately killed and part of it dressed for our evening's repast. The Negroes do not go to supper till late, and in order to amuse ourselves while our beef was preparing, a mandigo was desired to relate some diverting stories, 
in listening to which and smoking tobacco we spent three hours these stories bear some resemblance to those in the arabian nights entertainments but in general are of a more ludicrous cast about one o'clock in the afternoon of the third of december i took my leave of dr laidley and mrs ainsley and rode slowly into the woods i had now before me a boundless forest and a country the inhabitants of which were strangers to civilized life and to most of whom a white man was the object of curiosity or plunder i reflected that i had parted from the last european i might probably behold and perhaps quitted for ever the comforts of christian society thoughts like these would necessarily cast a gloom over my mind and i rode musing along for about three miles when i was awakened from my reverie by a body of people who came running up and stopped the asses giving me to understand that i must go with them to pekaba to present myself to the king of wali or pay customs to them i endeavored to make them comprehend that the object of my journey not being traffic i ought not to be subjected to a tax like the slatees and other merchants who travel for gain but i reasoned to no purpose they said it was usual for travelers of all descriptions to make a present to the king of wali and without doing so i could not be permitted to proceed as they were more numerous than my attendants and withal very noisy i thought it prudent to comply with their demand and having presented them with four bars of tobacco for the king's use i was permitted to continue my journey and at sunset reached a village near kutakunda where we rested for the night in the morning of december fourth i passed kutakunda the last town of wali and stopped about an hour at a small adjoining village to pay customs to an officer of the king of wali as we rested the ensuing night at a village called tabajang and at noon the next day december fifth we reached medina the capital of the king of wali's dominions the kingdom of wali is bounded by wali on the west by the gambia on the south by the small river wali on the northwest by bondu on the northeast and on the east by the simbani wilderness the inhabitants are mandingos and like most of the mandingo nations are divided into two great sects the mohammedans who are called bushreens and the pagans who are called indiscriminately kafirs unbelievers and sonikis i e men who drink strong liquors the pagan natives are by far the most numerous and the government of the country is in their hands for though the most respectable among the bushreens are frequently consulted in affairs of importance yet they are never permitted to take any share in the executive government which rests solely in the hands of the mansa or sovereign and the great officers of the state of these the first in point of rank is the presumptive heir of the crown who is called the farbana next to him are the alcades or provincial governors who are most frequently called chemos then follow the two grand divisions of free men and slaves of the former the slatees so frequently mentioned in the preceding pages are considered as the principal but in all classes great respect is paid to the authority of aged men on the death of the reigning monarch his eldest son if he has attained the age of manhood succeeds to the regal authority if there is no son or if the son is under the age of discretion a meeting of the great man is held and the late monarch's nearest relation commonly his brother is called to the government not as regent or guardian to the infant son 
but in full right and to the exclusion of the minor the charges of the government are defrayed by occasional tributes from the people and by duties on goods transported across the country travelers on going from the gambia towards the interior pay customs in european merchandise on returning they pay in iron and shitolu these taxes are paid at every town medina the capital of the kingdom at which i was now arrived is a place of considerable extent and may contain from eight hundred to one thousand houses it is fortified in the common african manner by a surrounding high wall built of clay and an outward fence of pointed stakes and prickly bushes but the walls are neglected and the outward fence has suffered considerably from the active hands of busy housewives who pluck up the stakes for firewood i obtained a lodging at one of the king's near relations who apprised me that my introduction to the king i must not presume to shake hands with him it was not usual he said to allow this liberty to strangers thus instructed i went in the afternoon to pay my respects to the sovereign and ask permission to pass through his territories to bondu the king's name was jatta he was the same venerable old man of whom so favorable an account was transmitted by major houghton i found him seated upon a mat before the door of his hut a number of men and women were arranged on each side who were singing and clapping their hands i saluted him respectfully and informed him of the purport of my visit the king graciously replied that he not only gave me leave to pass through his country but would offer up his prayers for my safety on this one of my attendants seemingly in return for the king's condescension began to sing or rather to roar an arabic song at every pause of which the king himself and all the people present struck their hands against their foreheads and exclaimed with devout and affecting solemnity amen amen the king told me furthermore that i should have a guide the day following who would conduct me safely to the frontier of his kingdom i then took my leave and in the evening sent the king an order upon dr laidley for three gallons of rum and received in return great store of provisions december sixth early in the morning i went to the king a second time to learn if the guide was ready i found his majesty seated upon a bullock's hide warming himself before a large fire for the africans are sensible of the smallest variation in the temperature of the air and frequently complain of cold when a european is oppressed with heat he received me with a benevolent countenance and tenderly entreated me to desist from my purpose of travelling into the interior telling me that major houghton had been killed in his route and that if i followed his footsteps i should probably meet with his fate he said that i must not judge of the people of the eastern country by those of woolly that the latter were acquainted with white men and respected them whereas the people of the east had never seen a white man and would certainly destroy me i thanked the king for his affectionate solicitude but told him that i considered the matter and was determined notwithstanding all dangers to proceed the king shook his head but desisted from further persuasion and told me the guide should be ready in the afternoon about two o'clock the guide appearing i went and took my last farewell of the good old king and in three hours reached conjure a small village where we determined to rest for the night here i purchased a fine sheep for some beads and my sarah woolly attendants killed it with all the ceremonies prescribed by their religion part of it was dressed for supper 
after which a dispute arose between one of the Sarah Woolley Negroes and Johnson, my interpreter, about the sheep's horns. The former claimed the horns as his perquisite for having acted the part of our butcher, and Johnson contested the claim. I settled the matter by giving a horn to each of them. This trifling incident is mentioned as introductory to what follows, for it appeared on inquiry that these horns were highly valued, as being easily convertible into portable sheaths or cases for containing and keeping secure certain charms or amulets called saffies, which the negroes constantly wear about them. These saffies are prayers, or rather sentences, from the Koran, which the Mohammedan priests write on scraps of paper, and sell to the simple natives, who consider them to possess very extraordinary virtues. Some of the negroes wear them to guard themselves against the bite of snakes or alligators, and on this occasion the saffy is commonly enclosed in a snake or alligator skin and tied round the ankle. Others have recourse to them in time of war to protect their persons against hostile weapons, but the common use to which these amulets are applied is to prevent or cure bodily diseases to preserve from hunger and thirst and generally to conciliate the favor of superior powers under all the circumstances and occurrences of life in this case it is impossible not to admire the wonderful contagion of superstition for notwithstanding that the majority of the negroes are pagans and absolutely reject the doctrines of mohammed I did not meet with a man, whether a Bushreen or Kaffir, who was not fully persuaded of the powerful efficacy of these amulets. The truth is that all the natives of this part of Africa consider the art of writing as bordering on magic, and it is not in the doctrines of the prophet, but in the arts of the magician, that their confidence is placed. It will hereafter be seen that I was myself lucky enough, in circumstances of distress, to turn the popular credulity in this respect to good account. On the seventh I departed from Conjure and slept at a village called Mala, or Maling, and on the eighth about noon I arrived at Kalur a considerable town near the entrance into which i observed hanging upon a tree a sort of masquerade habit made of the bark of trees which i was told on inquiry belonged to mumbo jumbo this is a strange bugbear common to all the mandigo towns and much employed by the pagan natives in keeping their women in subjection for as the kaffirs are not restricted in the number of their wives every one marries as many as he can conveniently maintain and as it frequently happens that the ladies disagree among themselves family quarrels sometimes rise to such a height that the authority of the husband can no longer preserve peace in his household in such cases the interposition of mumbo-jumbo is called in and is always decisive this strange minister of justice who is supposed to be either the husband himself or some person instructed by him disguised in the dress that has been mentioned and armed with the rod of public authority announces his coming whenever his services are required by loud and dismal screams in the woods near the town he begins the pantomime at the approach of night and as soon as it is dark he enters the town and proceeds to the bentang at which all the inhabitants immediately assemble december ninth as there was no water to be procured on the road we travelled with great expedition until we reached tambacunda 
and departing from thence early the next morning the tenth we reached in the evening kunikari a town of nearly the same magnitude as kalor about noon on the eleventh we arrived at kujar the frontier town of Wooli, towards bondu from which it is separated by an interweaving wilderness of two days journey the guide appointed by the king of Wooli, being now to return i presented him with some amber for his trouble and having been informed that it was not possible at all times to procure water in the wilderness i made inquiry for men who would serve both as guides and water bearers during my journey across it three negroes elephant hunters offered their services for these purposes which i accepted and paid them three bars each in advance and the day being far spent i determined to pass the night in my present quarters the inhabitants of kujar though not wholly unaccustomed to the sight of europeans most of them having occasionally visited the countries of the gambia beheld me with a mixture of curiosity and reverence and in the evening invited me to see a neo bearing or wrestling match at the bentang this is an exhibition very common in all the mandingo countries the spectators arranged themselves in a circle leaving the intermediate space for the wrestlers who were strong active young men full of emulation and accustomed i suppose from their infancy to this sort of exertion being stripped of their clothing except a short pair of drawers and having their skin anointed with oil or shea butter approached each other on all fours pairing with and occasionally extending a hand for some time till at length one of them sprang forward and caught his rival by the knee great dexterity and judgment were now displayed but the contest was decided by superior strength and i think that few europeans would have been able to cope with the conqueror it must not be unobserved that the combatants were animated by the music of a drum by which their actions were in some measure regulated the wrestling was succeeded by a dance in which many performers assisted all of whom were provided with little bells which were fastened to their legs and arms and here too the drum regulated their motions it was beaten with a crooked stick which the drummer held in his right hand occasionally using his left to deaden the sound and thus vary the music the drama is likewise applied on these occasions to keep order among the spectators by imitating the sound of certain mandingo sentences for example when the wrestling match is about to begin the drummer strikes what is understood to signify ali bo si sit all down upon which the spectators immediately seat themselves and when the combatants are to begin he strikes amuta amuta take hold take hold in the course of the evening i was presented by way of refreshment with a liquor which tasted so much like the strong beer of my native country and very good beer too as to induce me to inquire into its composition and i learnt with some degree of surprise that it was actually made from corn which had been previously malted much in the same manner as barley is malted in great britain a root yielding a grateful bitter was used in lieu of hops the name of which i have forgotten but the corn which yields the wort is the holcus sketus of botanists early in the morning the twelfth i found that one of the elephant hunters had absconded with the money he had received from me in part of wages and in order to prevent the other two from following his example i made them instantly fill their calabashes or gourds with water 
and as the sun rose i entered the wilderness that separates the kingdoms of woolly and bondu we continued our journey without stopping any more until noon when we came to a large tree called by the natives nemba taba it had a very singular appearance being decorated with innumerable rags or scraps of cloth which persons travelling across the wilderness had at different times tied to the branches probably at first to inform the traveller that water was to be found near it but the custom had been so greatly sanctioned by time that nobody now presumes to pass without hanging up something i followed the example and suspended a handsome piece of cloth on one of the boughs and being told that either a well or pool of water was at no great distance i ordered the negroes to unload the asses that we might give them corn and regale ourselves with the provisions we had brought in the meantime i sent one of the elephant hunters to look for the well intending if water was to be obtained to rest here for the night a pool was found but the water was thick and muddy and the negro discovered near it the remains of a fire recently extinguished and the fragments of provisions which afforded a proof that it had been lately visited either by travellers or bandetti the fears of my attendants supposed the latter and believing that robbers lurked near as i was persuaded to change my resolution of resting here all night and proceed to another watering place which i was assured we might reach early in the evening we departed accordingly but it was eight o'clock at night before we came to the watering place and being now sufficiently fatigued with a long day's journey we kindled a large fire and lay down surrounded by our cattle on the bare ground more than a gunshot from any bush the negroes agreeing to keep watch by turns to prevent surprise i know not indeed that any danger was justly to be dreaded but the negroes were unaccountably apprehensive of bandetti during the whole of the journey as soon therefore as daylight appeared we filled our soufrous skins and calabashes at the pool and set out for Talikia, the first town in bondu which we reached about eleven o'clock in the forenoon the thirteenth of december End of Volume 1, Chapter 3 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Volume 1, Chapter 4 Of Travels in the Interior of Africa by Mungo Park This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Talika to Kaja Talika, the frontier town of Bondu towards Wuli, is inhabited chiefly by Fulas of the Mohammedan region, who live in considerable affluence, partly by furnishing provisions to the coffles or caravans that pass through the town, and partly by the sale of ivory obtained by hunting elephants, in which employment the young men are generally very successful here an officer belonging to the king of bondu constantly resides whose business it is to give timely information of the arrival of the caravans which are taxed according to the number of loaded asses that arrive at talika i took up my residence at this officer's house and agreed with him to accompany me to fataconda the residence of the king for which he was to receive five bars and before my departure i wrote a few lines to dr Laidley, and gave my letter to the master of a caravan bound for the gambia this caravan consisted of nine or ten people with five asses loaded with ivory the large teeth are conveyed in nets two on each side of the ass 
the small ones are wrapped up in skins and secured with ropes december fourteenth we left talica and rode on very peacefully for about two miles when a violent quarrel arose between two of my fellow travellers one of whom was the blacksmith in the course of which they bestowed some opprobrious terms upon each other and it is worthy of remark that an african will sooner forgive a blow than a term of reproach applied to his ancestors strike me but do not curse my mother is a common expression even among the slaves this sort of abuse therefore so enraged one of the disputants that he drew his cutlass upon the blacksmith and would certainly have ended the dispute in a very serious manner if the others had not laid hold of him and wrestled the cutlass from him i was obliged to interfere and put an end to this disagreeable business by desiring the blacksmith to be silent and telling the other who i thought was in the wrong that if he attempted in future to draw his cutlass or molest any of my attendants i should look upon him as a robber and shoot him without further ceremony this threat had the desired effect and we marched sullenly along till the afternoon when we arrived at a number of small villages scattered over an open and fertile plain at one of these called ganado we took up our residence for the night here an exchange of presents and a good supper terminated all animosities among my attendants and the night was far advanced before any of us thought of going to sleep we were amused by an itinerant singing man who told a number of diverting stories and played some sweet airs by blowing his breath upon a bowstring and striking it at the same time with a stick december fifteenth at daybreak my fellow travellers the sarah woolies took leave of me with many prayers for my safety about a mile from gando we crossed a considerable branch of the gambia called nerico the banks were steep and covered with mimosas and i observed in the mud a number of large mussels but the natives do not eat them about noon the sun being exceedingly hot we rested two hours in the shade of a tree and purchased some milk and pounded corn from some fula herdsmen and at sunset reached a town called Kirkcarney, where the blacksmith had some relations and here we rested two days Corkinary is a mohammedan town surrounded by a high wall and is provided with a mosque here i was shown a number of arabic manuscripts particularly a copy of the book before mentioned called al shara the marabou or priest in whose possession it was read and explained to me in mandingo many of the most remarkable passages and in return i showed him richardson's arabic grammar which he very much admired on the evening of the second day december seventeenth we departed from corkinari we were joined by a young man who was travelling to fataconda for salt and as night set in we reached doggy a small village about three miles from corkinari provisions here so cheap that i purchased a bullock for six small stones of amber for i found my company increase or diminish according to the good fare they met with december eighteenth early in the morning we departed from doggy and being joined by a number of fulas and other people made a formidable appearance and were under no apprehension of being plundered in the woods about eleven o'clock one of the asses proving very refractory the negroes took a courteous method to make him tractable they cut a forked stick and putting the forked part into the ass's mouth like the bit of a bridle tied the two smaller parts together above his head leaving the lower part of the stick 
of sufficient length to strike against the ground if the ass should attempt to put his head down after this the ass walked along quietly and gravely enough taking care after some practice to hold his head sufficiently high to prevent stones or roots of trees from striking against the end of the stick which experience had taught him would give a severe shock to his teeth this contrivance produced a ludicrous appearance but my fellow travellers told me it was constantly adapted by the slatees and always proved effectual in the evening we arrived at a few scattered villages surrounded with extensive cultivation at one of which called bugil we passed the night in a miserable hut having no other bed than a bundle of corn stalks and no provisions but we brought with us the wells here are dug with great ingenuity and are very deep i measured one of the bucket ropes and found the depth of the well to be twenty-eight fathoms december nineteenth we departed from bugali and travelled along a dry stony height covered with mimosas till midday when the land sloped towards the east and we descended into a deep valley in which i observed abundance of windstone and white quartz pursuing our course to the eastward along this valley in the bed of an exhausted river course we came to a large village where we intended to lodge we found many of the natives dressed in a thin french gauze which they called baiqui thus being a light airy dress as well calculated to display the shape of their persons is much esteemed by the ladies the manners of these females however did not correspond with their dress for they were rude and troublesome in the highest degree they surrounded me in numbers begging for amber beads etc and were so vehement in their solicitations that i found it impossible to resist them they tore my cloak cut the buttons from my boy's clothes and were proceeding to other outrages when i mounted my horse and rode off followed for half a mile by a body of these harpies in the evening we reached subrudoka and as my company was numerous being fourteen i purchased a sheep and abundance of corn for supper after which we lay down by the bundles and passed an uncomfortable night in a heavy dew december twentieth we departed from subrudoka and at two o'clock reached a large village situated on the banks of the falem river which is here rapid and rocky the natives were employed in fishing in various ways the large fish were taken in long baskets made of split cane and placed in a strong current which was created by walls of stone built across the stream certain open places being left though which the water rushed with great force some of these baskets were more than twenty feet long and once the fish had entered one of them the force of the stream prevented it from returning the small fish were taken in great numbers in hand nets which the natives weave of cotton and use with great dexterity the fish last mentioned are about the size of sprats and are prepared for sale in different ways the most common is by pounding them entire as they come from the stream in a wooden mortar and exposing them to dry in the sun in large lumps like sugar loaves it may be supposed that the smell is not very agreeable but in the moorish countries to the north of the senegal where fish is scarcely known this preparation is esteemed as a luxury and sold to considerable advantage the matter of using it by the natives is by dissolving a piece of this black loaf in boiling water and mixing it with their couscous on return to the village after an excursion to the riverside to inspect the fishery an old moor sheriff came to bestow his blessing upon me and begged some paper to write safis upon 
the man had seen major hooton in the kingdom of carta and told me that he died in the country of the moors about three in the afternoon we continued our course along the bank of the river to the northward till eight o'clock when we reached Naimau. here the hospital master of the town received us kindly and presented us with a bullock in return i gave him some amber and beads december twenty first in the morning having agreed for a canoe to carry over my bundles i crossed the river which came up to my knees as i sat on my horse but the water is so clear that from the high bank the bottom is visible all the way over about noon we entered fataconda the capital of bondu and in a little time received an invitation to the house of a respectable slattee for as there are no public houses in africa it is customary for strangers to stand at the betang or some other place of public resort till they are invited to a lodging by some of the inhabitants we accepted the offer and in an hour afterwards a person came and told me he was sent on purpose to conduct me to the king who was very desirous of seeing me immediately if i was not too much fatigued i took my interpreter with me and followed the messenger till we got quite out of town and crossed some cornfields when suspecting some trick i stopped and asked the guide whither he was going upon which he pointed to a man sitting under a tree at some little distance and told me that the king frequently gave audience in that retired manner in order to avoid a crowd of people and that nobody but myself and my interpreter must approach him when i advanced the king desired me to come and sit by him upon the mat and after hearing my story on which b made no observation he asked if i wished to purchase any slaves or gold being answered in the negative he seemed rather surprised but desired me to come to him in the evening and he would give me some provisions this monarch was called alamani a moorish name though i was told he was not a mohammedan but a kaffir or pagan i had heard that he had acted towards major houghton with some unkindness and caused him to be plundered his behavior therefore towards myself at this interview though much more civil than i expected was far from freeing me from uneasiness i still apprehended some double dealing and as i was now entirely in his power i thought it best to smooth the way by a present accordingly i took with me in the evening one canister of gunpowder some amber tobacco and my umbrella and as i considered that my bundles would inevitably be searched i concealed some few articles in the roof of the hut where i lodged and put on my new blue coat in order to preserve it all the houses belonging to the king and his family are surrounded by a lofty mud wall which converts the whole into a kind of citadel the interior is subdivided into different courts at the first place of entrance i observed a man standing with a musket on his shoulder and i found the way to the presence very intricate leading through many passages with sentinels placed at the different doors when we came to the entrance of the court in which the king resides both my guide and my interpreter according to custom took off their sandals and the former pronounced the king's name aloud repeating it till he was answered from within we found the monarch sitting upon a mat and two attendants with him i repeated what i had before told him concerning the object of my journey and my reasons for passing through his country he seemed however but half satisfied when i offered to show him the contents of my portmanteau and everything belonging to me he was convinced and it was evident that his suspicion had arisen from a belief 
that every white man must of necessity be a traitor when i had delivered my presents he seemed well pleased and was particularly delighted with the umbrella which he repeatedly furled and unfurled to the great admiration of himself and his two attendants who could not for some time comprehend the use of this wonderful machine after this i was about to take my leave when the king desiring me to stop a while began a long preamble in favor of the whites extolling their immense wealth and good dispositions he next proceeded to an eulogium on my blue coat of which the yellow buttons seemed particularly to catch his fancy and he concluded by entreating me to present him with it assuring me for my consolation under the loss of it that he would wear it on all public occasions and inform every one who saw it of my great liberality towards him the request of an african prince in his own dominions particularly when made to a stranger comes little short of a command it is only a way of obtaining by gentle means what he can if he pleases take by force and as it was against my interest to offend him by a refusal i very quietly took off my coat the only good one in my possession and laid it at his feet in return for my compliance he presented me with a great plenty of provisions and desired to see me again in the morning i accordingly attended and found in sitting upon his bed he told me he was sick and wished to have a little blood taken from him but i had no sooner tied up his arm and displayed the lancet than his courage failed and he begged me to postpone the operation till the afternoon as he felt himself he said much better than he had been and thanked me kindly for my readiness to serve him he then observed that his women were very desirous to see me and requested that i would favor them with the visit an attendant was ordered to conduct me and i had no sooner entered the court appropriated to the ladies than the whole seraglio surrounded me some begging for psychic some for amber and all of them desirous of trying that great african specific bloodletting they were ten or twelve in number most of them young and handsome and wearing on their heads ornaments of gold and beads of amber they rallied me with a good deal of gaiety on different subjects particularly upon the whiteness of my skin and the prominency of my nose they insisted they were both artificial the first they said was produced when i was an infant by dipping me in milk and they insisted that my nose had been pinched every day till it had acquired its present unsightly and unnatural conformation on my part without disputing my own deformity i paid them many compliments on african beauty I praised the glossy jet of their skins and the lovely depression of their noses but they said that flattery or as they emphatically termed it honey mouth was not esteemed in bondu in return however for my company or my compliments to which by the way they seemed not so insensible as they affected to be they presented me with a jar of honey and some fish which were sent to my lodging and i was desired to come again to the king's a little before sunset i carried with me some beads and writing paper it being usual to present some small offering on taking leave in return for which the king gave me five drums of gold observing that it was but a trifle and given out of pure friendship but would be of use to me in travelling for the purchase of provisions he seconded this act of kindness by one still greater politely telling me that though it was customary to examine the baggage of every traveller passing through his country yet in the present instance 
he would dispense without ceremony adding i was at liberty to depart when i pleased accordingly on the morning of the twenty-third we left fataconda and about eleven o'clock came to a small village where we determined to stop for the rest of the day in the afternoon my fellow travellers informed me that as this was the boundary between bondu and kaja and dangerous for travellers it would be necessary to continue our journey by night until we should reach a more hospitable part of the country i agreed to the proposal and hired two people for guides through the woods and as soon as the people of the village were gone to sleep the moon shining bright we set out the stillness of the air the howling of the wild beasts and the deep solitude of the forest made the scene solemn and oppressive not a word was uttered by any of us but in a whisper all were attentive and every one anxious to show his sagacity by pointing out to me the wolves and hyenas as they glided like shadows from one thicket to another towards morning we arrived at a village called kimu where our guides awakened one of their acquaintances and we stopped to give the asses some corn and roast a few ground nuts for ourselves at daylight we resumed our journey and in the afternoon arrived at jog in the kingdom of kaja being now in a country among a people differing in many respects from those that have as yet fallen under our observation i shall before i proceed further give some account of bondu the territory we have left and its inhabitants the fulas the description of whom i purposely reserve for this part of my work bondu is bound on the east by bambuk on the southeast and south by tenda and the simbani wilderness on the southwest by woolly and on the west by futa tora and on the north by kaja the country like that of woolly is very generally covered with woods but the land is more elevated and towards the Falme river rises into considerable hills its native fertility the soil is not surpassed i believe in any part of africa from the central situation of bondu between the gambia and senegal rivers it is become a place of great resort both for the slatees who generally pass through it on going from the coast to the interior countries and for occasional traders who frequently come hither from the inland countries to purchase salt these different branches of commerce are conducted principally by mandigos and sirawoolies who have settled in the country these merchants likewise carry on a considerable trade with the jedumua and other moorish countries bartering corn and blue cotton clothes for salt which they again barter in dentilla and other districts for iron shea butter and small quantities of gold dust they likewise sell a variety of sweet-smelling gums packed up in small bags containing each about a pound these gums being thrown on hot embers produce a very pleasant odor and are used by the mandingos for perfuming their huts and clothes the customs or duties on travelers are very heavy in almost every town an assload pays a bar of european merchandise and at fataconda the residence of the king one indian baft or a musket and six bottles of gunpowder are exacted as the common tribute by means of these duties the king of bondu is well supplied with arms and ammunition a circumstance which makes him formidable to the neighboring states the inhabitants differ in their complexions and national manners from the mandingos and sarawoolies with whom they are frequently at war some years ago the king of bondu crossed the falme river with a numerous army and after a short and bloody campaign 
totally defeated the forces of Sambu, king of Bambuk, who was obliged to sue for peace, and surrender to him all the towns along the eastern bank of the Falmi. The Fulas in general, as has been observed in a former chapter, are of tawny complexion, with small features and soft, silky hair. Next to the Mandingos, they are undoubtedly the most considerable of all the nations in this part of Africa. Their original country is said to be Fuladu, which signifies the country of the Fulas, but they possess at present many other kingdoms at a great distance from each other. Their complexion, however, is not exactly the same in the different districts. In Bondu and the other kingdoms which are situated in the vicinity of the Moorish territories, they are of a more yellow complexion than in the southern states. The Fulas of Bondu are naturally of a mild and gentle disposition, but the uncharitable maxims of the Koran have made them less hospitable to strangers and more reserved in their behavior than the mandingos they evidently consider all the negro natives as their inferiors and when talking of different nations always rank themselves among the white people their government differs from that of the mandingos chiefly in this that they are more immediately under the influence of mohammedan laws for all the chief men the king accepted and a large majority of the inhabitants of bondu are mussulmans and the authority and laws of the prophet are everywhere looked upon as sacred and decisive in the exercise of their faith however they are not very intolerant towards such of their countrymen as still retain their ancient superstitions religious persecution is not known among them nor is it necessary for the system of mohammed is made to extend itself by means abundantly more efficacious by establishing small schools in the different towns where many of the pagan as well as the mohammedan children are taught to read the koran and instructed in the tenets of the prophet the mohammedan priests fix a bias on their minds and form the character of their young disciples which no accidents of life can ever afterward remove or alter many of these little schools i visited in my progress through the country and i observed with pleasure the great docility and submissive deportment of the children and heartily wished they had better instructors and a pure religion with the Mohammedan faith is also introduced the Arabic language, with which most of the Fulas have a slight acquaintance. Their native tongue abounds very much in liquids, but there is something unpleasant in the manner of pronouncing it. A stranger on hearing the common conversation of two Fulas would imagine that they were scolding each other. Their numerals are these. One go two d d three tete four knee five jui six jago seven jadidi eight jateti nine jani ten sapo the industry of the fulas in the occupations of pasturage and agriculture is everywhere remarkable even on the banks of the gambia the greater part of the corn is raised by them and their herds and flocks are more numerous and in better condition than those of the mandingos but in bondu they are opulent in a high degree and enjoy all the necessities of life in the greatest profusion they display great skill in the management of their cattle making them extremely gentle by kindness and familiarity. On the approach of the night, they are collected from the woods and secured in folds called karees, which are constructed in the neighborhood of the different villages. In the middle of each karee is erected 
a small hut wherein one or two of the herdsmen keep watch during the night to prevent the cattle from being stolen and to keep up the fires which are kindled round the quarry to frighten away wild beasts the cattle are milked in the mornings and evenings the milk is excellent but the quantity obtained from one any one cow is by no means so great as in europe the fulas use the milk chiefly as an article of diet and that not until it is quite sour the cream which it affords is very thick and is converted into butter by stirring it violently in a large calabash this butter when melted over a gentle fire is freed from impurities is preserved in small earthen pots and forms a part in most of their dishes it serves likewise to anoint their heads and is bestowed very liberally on their faces and arms but although milk is plentiful it is somewhat remarkable that the fulas and indeed all the inhabitants of this part of africa are totally unacquainted with the art of making cheese a firm attachment to the customs of their ancestors makes them view with an eye of prejudice everything that looks like innovation the heat of the climate and the great scarcity of salt are held forth as unanswerable objections and the whole process appears to them too long and troublesome to be attended with any solid advantage besides the cattle which constitute the chief wealth of the fulas they possess some excellent horses the breed of which seems to be a mixture of the arabian with the original african End of Volume 1, Chapter 4 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.